Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you're calling in from. My name is Ray Arata, and I want to welcome you to the Better Man Movement's Friday Getting Real series, with our topic today being sustaining masculinity. It's hard to believe, but it's already been one week since our Pacific Time Virtual Better Man Conference, and less than two weeks until our Eastern Time October 8th Better Man Conference. <clears throat> you know, every week I, I um, think about what I want to say. Uh, when I opened up and I realized five years ago when I brought healthy masculinity into the leadership conversation by founding the Better Man Conference, I must admit I got a lot of funny looks, confused looks, some comments that I won't repeat, <laughs> but most importantly, I got enough positive comments that convinced me that there was a, a there there. Finally, there was going to be a conference that had as its focus getting men in the game of being allies and inclusionary leaders. That was a theme for one of our years. But a couple of days ago, um, I realized what I was actually doing, but this didn't occur to me consciously, that I was challenging men's assumptions around masculinity, but it never came out right and said that. You know, whatever it takes, right? <laughs> now, getting organizations to be open and to embrace this was a completely different animal. Thankfully, companies like Intel, Genentech, HP, PwC and Kaiser Permanente all supported the idea. So I thought a little bit more about this and I realized that this phase was starting healthy masculinity. Now I'll admit, and my partners can attest, it's been a grind, but we never took our eye off the ball. And fortunately, more companies joined the movement. And then the Time's Up and Me Too movement provided additional impetus for companies to put attention and intention on men in the context of diversity, inclusion, and belonging initiatives. Now, it came to my attention a few years ago that one man who's here with us today attended the first Better Man conference, and he went back to his company, Intel, and he shared his experience. His name is Vic Timchenko. Now, largely due to his own enthusiasm, the movement inside Intel is spread internally, and as such, they're one of our most committed sponsors. His advocacy for programs is a big reason why we're still here. Now, additionally, Jim Gordon, another male ally who was on our stage, He's walking to talk internally in support of Intel's bold goals around DNI. And one of the things I love about Jim is his humility and his commitment to learning so that he can be a model for other men because we need a lot of men like him and Vic. We've asked both of them to join us today. And today is about sustaining healthy, inclusive masculinity. And my hope is we're going to have a great show. Over to you, Ed. Thanks, Ray. Um... Just a reminder that all the work we do is about uh, heart-based leadership and a reminder of the principles. And we want to take a minute, and uh, this list, unfortunately, is no longer complete. Um, but we want to take a minute and remember those who have died and been impacted by uh, systemic racism, by the COVID virus, by... Um, all the things that we're out to uh, cure in society. So let's just take a minute. Thank you. So for those of you that haven't been with us before, uh, just a few guidelines. First of all, feel free to update your name, to include your preferred pronouns. You can do that by just going up to the three dots in the upper right-hand corner of your window and choosing rename. Uh, respect and honor confidentiality. Take a risk, participate. There's gonna be lots of opportunity to participate on chat or out loud. And remember, uh, when you speak your truth, you might be speaking for others. Uh, stay present, focused on the conversation. Seek first to be aware before reacting. Sorry. Uh, be open to what's possible. Park your judgments. And if much as possible, one person speak at a time. And our goal is to create a safe space. So with that, I'm going to turn it back to you, Ray, and to our guests and take it from there. Yeah, I just want to allow everybody a chance to get a quick read on, on, on the bios of our guests today. And while you're doing that, just take this opportunity to welcome you, Jim, 
uh, and Vic in this virtual space that we're in. Um, looking forward to our conversation today. And so the way I'd like to start, if we can remove that slide, just go to the, the, the main view. Um, what I'd love to do uh, with both of you is uh, start with this can for a question. Why is the focus on healthy masculinity important to both of you as individuals and for Intel? Or put another way, what's the intrigue? Um, whoever, who would like to go first, Vic or Jim? You can take the first shot at it. Sure. Um, there's, I, it's about accepting everyone in, and enabling people to be their best and making people feel welcome um, and, and, and not excluded. Um, you know, without inclusion will never succeed and, and there's aspects of masculinity that are um, I, I guess poison I, I mean it, it really shuts things down um, and, and we have to be aware of those things we have to call out our peers in, in that respect um, and, and um, as you start to work this and, and you put in systems and programs to minimize bias and, and find that hidden talent that may not be as connected and networked as some of the quote unquote majority type folks. Um, it makes a big difference and, and people see it and really appreciate it. Thank you. What about you, Jim? Yeah. So, you know, if you look at, uh, set Intel aside for a second, if you look at the tech industry, uh, overall, um, that, I mean, this topic was very interesting to me because as I observed the tech industry overall, it's, it's all been about historically, uh, rewarding and expecting and tolerating what we would now define as kind of toxic masculinity. It was not only tolerated, but it was kind of expected to move forward. And especially as we get into this time of, uh, you know, trying to evolve as, as companies, as an industry, as individual people, um, you know, I think we need to recognize that and, um, and evolve it, both you know, me, uh, Intel, and then all of our tech peers as well. Because if we don't, if we don't recognize that and address it, then it will prohibit us from achieving some of the larger DNI goals that we, that we espouse to uh, espouse to pursue. So that's what is that's what's so interesting to me and makes it so important to me personally. Thank you for that, Jim. I, I want to encourage uh, everyone on the call, feel free in chat to answer the same question. You know, why is healthy masculinity important to you? Why might it be important to your organization? Uh, so I want to pull the thread just a little bit more, uh, Jim and Vic, and, and have you just, let's be overt about putting the attention on men. You guys are pioneers in your own right, you know, leading the way doing this. But how is, how, is there a permeation? Is there an acceptance of healthy masculinity that you're starting to see more men and, and other folks open up to inside your org? If so, what's that looking like? So, I, yes, uh, especially over the last uh, couple of years. I think uh, prior to that, it would have been, um, I wouldn't call it frown upon, but it wouldn't be a you know, strategy for behavior to, um, you know, to advance. But I think now it's, uh, it's really turning around and uh, all of our, you know, many of our examples, including our CEO, uh, really exhibit many of the traits that I think you have described as healthy ma masculinity. And, um, and we're starting to see things turn around such that uh, it's allowed, it's expected, it's um, encouraged, which is, is only going to help us with all the other things we need to, you know, be achieving in this area. What about you, Vic? What do you think? I, I totally agree with that. And we've also done a shift in terms of, you know, setting expectations of our leadership where previously most of the emphasis was on um, the results, the, the impact. And, and now we've shifted to kind of three pillars. It's, it's the results and impact, you know, the what was achieved as well as how the individuals achieved those results. Was it inclusive? Were, in that respect, and of course, the third one is, are we learning and developing? So that shift from an expectations perspective um, really set, set it up in terms of 
um, people trying to understand what that really means. It actually drives a conversation. Wait a minute, I'm being measured to that. What does that mean? What does that, what does it look like? What do I need to do more of? What do I need to do less of? And then um, there's an aspect of, um, there's been um, a lot of times, it's uh, situation by situation, person by person, and having the courage to reach out and say, hey, um, what you did there, and it, it doesn't have to be in the meeting, sometimes it does depending on the severity, but having a conversation with someone offline and saying, you know how you came across, and it, oftentimes a difficult conversation, um, but in, in most cases, you, if you can explain it from their, from their perspective in, in words or, or you know, from, from, from their belief systems, um, they'll recognize it. And I've, I've actually had folks break into tears once they understood the impact they had on other individuals. And um, that to me is super powerful. And um, it's, you know, it's culture change. It's not something you go take a training and you're done, right? And you, you do that for one person and there's another person and it just spreads. It's been pretty awesome. Yeah, just, if I can add on to that, I totally agree with everything uh, Vic said. Um, and just to emphasize one point that you know, top leadership could um, say and write and uh, have their teams say and write certain expectations and certain you know ways of leading that are expected. But if you don't if you don't do it every time, people see it, and it won't matter what you write or what you say. Um, and then the second thing I'd say, you know, what got us as individuals, Vic and I, and what got this company to the point we're at right now, in terms of what we did and how we did it, is not the same, it is going to take us to where we need to be. And I think, you know, as long as we recognize that, you know, respect history, but don't be, you know, dictated by it, it will be in a better place. Yeah. So thanks for that. So Vic, I want to just pull the thread just a little bit more. You were the first one that came to the conference. What was it like for you bringing up this topic to other men and women? And that's part A of the question. And then what, what's been the shift over the, over the last couple of years? Yeah, um, I, I kind of walked into it not really knowing what to expect, um, but it, it really changed my outlook, both you know, from a work perspective as well as my personal life. And I still remember, and I, I use you know two two kind of key takeaways, and that is, it's not my fault, but I am responsible. That was a key theme from that first one. And um, privilege is invisible to those who have it. That really you know, kind of stopped me in my tracks and, and made me think. Um, and, and I brought those back to my coworkers, and I engaged with um, a lot of women uh, at the time that were driving uh, diversity type. And I was one of the, uh, one, one of the few males and I kind of sat back and thought, okay, we, we have these women's events, uh, but are we sp speaking to the wrong audience, to the wrong crowd? And um, starting to have the real conversations, listening to the challenges women face, um, and, and that um, vulnerability, establishing relationship and trust um, took a long ways to get there. And then reaching out to men um, and, and explaining from I think, I think sometimes when men hear it from women, they take it a different way than when men hear it from men. So I think that was a, a positive in terms of what I was able to bring. And um, it, it um, like I said, it, it kind of expanded and, and people kind of got it. And I, I remember um, several years after, I, I remember um, some people coming up to me and saying, thank you so much for caring all these years. And so that to me just made it all worthwhile. Well, Jim, you have anything to add to that? Um, you know, the, uh, the, the thing that gets me excited uh, around this topic is this notion that, uh, you know, historically for all topics like uh, uh, diversity, inclusion, and what we're talking about today, um, my observation has been that like 90 plus percent of the investment and energy and effort has been uh, with and to and from the groups that are affected by the environment. So underrepresented minorities, uh, women in the workplace, et cetera. And um, all the men had been on the sidelines, um, either uh, not invited in or not understanding how to participate or believing that they don't have a role to play. And um, 
what I like about Better Man Conference and all the things you're talking about today and the things that, you know, Vic and I are uh, participating in Inside Intel and many other men like us is that we're realizing that we have a role that um, the groups that are affected are necessary but insufficient for cultural long-term change. Uh, and that we are expecting we all win by getting involved. Right? Thanks for that. So, so Jim, before we got on the call today, I, I mentioned I might ask you this question around COVID and you've been doing a lot of work around COVID. All of us have, I mean, here we are virtually having a, a, a virtual live conversation. How, how is your COVID work intersected with healthy masculinity, if it has, or what has it brought forward? Well, I mean, I think, I think one of the traits uh, of healthy masculinity is, um, is going into situations, new programs, new areas, either personal life or at work and, uh, you know, having the humility to understand that you don't have all the answers. Um, and sometimes you don't even have the right questions to ask. And with respect to COVID, I mean, having that kind of a mindset and trying to spread that mindset amongst the team that I work with, it, you know, we as a company, we're, you know, we're a tech leader, uh, a very top tech leader, but that doesn't necessarily mean we know how to apply our technology to, you know, contribute to a solution around COVID-19. And as long as you have an open, uh, vulnerable, um, you know, humility, and you bring that to the table, then I think you get the best ideas from those around you. And those could be people or those could be other companies. And I think that's served us well. Yeah, vulnerability is one of our heart-based leadership principles. And um, we've watched over the years at the conference see more and more men em embrace vulnerability as a cornerstone of their leadership. It engenders trust. Uh, it lightens the, the, the load on themselves and it makes room for other people to bring their perspectives forward. So what we're going to do now is we're going to go to our first breakout. So Ed, if you can put that slide. Um, so the, here's the invitation for when you go into breakout. Um, to, to think about. What practices have you put in place with regard to inclusion? I'm going to invite all of you to think in terms of how healthy masculinity might play in this, but introduce yourselves and take a stab at, at answering this question. And if you haven't put practices into place, what, what practices might make some sense? So we're going to move you into breakout and we'll give you a warning uh, when we come back. All right, so for those of you, this is, if this is your first time, what we like to do right now is we want to um, create that classroom feel where we want to give all of you an opportunity to um, share what came up for you in the breakout, what you learned, what you noticed, um, and to use chat, uh, raise your hand so we can call on you. Uh, and then we'll just allow the conversation to go. And, and if you've got some questions, you know, feel free to, to ask some questions as well. So, so who would like to go first? Ray, Benita had a question in chat before the breakouts. Uh, I want to check sure. with her. So Benita, go ahead. Actually, my question was about Intel's culture, and, and I, I did get an answer in the breakout session. My, years ago, Intel's culture was a just uh, very strongly devil's advocate and very competitive. And that even the management book that came out about how to manage an organization was all about devil's advocate, which I have found really kills off a lot of women and, and underrepresented groups as uh, a culture and uh, as a practice. So, but I found in that uh, Scott uh, was sharing uh, in our group and he told told me that things have really changed dramatically with the heads of Intel uh, changing, or at least some of the groups. I wasn't quite sure which was which, but um, I think that's really uh, terrific. And um, to me, it's been the most important factor in my teaching. Um, I teach at Santa Clara University in the, in the School of mm -hmm. Engineering and found it makes a huge difference for people to understand the difference between dev devil's advocate, which bulletproofs an idea with questions, and angel's advocate, which builds ideas and expands ideas, more uh, divergent thinking rather than convergent. Anyway, it was wonderful to be able to have that. Um, and his, the, the way he's making a difference, inspired by his daughters, which he had mentioned in the chat, um, really, 
I told him that it makes a difference for me just to hear his story. You know, he's gratified by knowing that he's making a difference for the people that he's working with. But I wanted him to know that it gratifies me even to hear his story about gratifying the people he's working with. Thanks, Benita. Thank you for that, Benita. You know, in, in hearing you articulate that, especially on the front end of your, your share, it made me uh, think about a term that one of my friends who's on the call today, Rayona Sharpneck, um, from the Institute for Women's Leadership, described as cultural sludge. And, and when you have the unspoken way of doing things inherent in an organization, and everyone toes that line consciously and or unconsciously, nothing's going to change. Yeah. So I'm, it's warming to hear that some of the men are you know, taking this head on and shifting their behavior, because that's, that's what we need. We need that sea tide of behavior change to just break down you know the the, the culture change hey, Ray, um, can i make a comment yeah please do yeah so along those lines um i used to have a boss that was exactly how you just described kind of that culture the leadership culture yeah. and um when i got into this inclusion and in in my one-on-ones with him i would explain to him how he was coming across and it was about a year-long project and he came to the point, he was pretty senior, uh, he retired. Um, but at his retirement party, he, he, he'd been there a long time. Uh, he talked about, you know, the great people he met, the great accomplishments. And then he added, and this is something he didn't have to do. He added the last year of his career, he learned something new. And he, he talked about the importance of diversity and inclusion and how it really shifted his thinking in that space. So that was just to me, an amazing thing to see, you know, you can actually do it. It's not easy, but you can do it. Thank you for that, Vic. Um, Jonathan Hoyt, I see you answered in chat. I'm going to invite you to speak a little more to what, um, what you observed in your breakout with respect to Riona's share. Go ahead and come off mute. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, no, I, Riona shared a really interesting point about um, how, men are often socialized to kind of be the be the storyteller be the center of attention take up the space in a conversation and we can we can sort of be aware of that impulse and and allow kind of instead focus on creating space for people to talk and people to share and and for us to hear um, and the other idea that i just that hit me as we talked in the breakout was just about how valuable it can be simply to tap into curiosity. You know, what do I see happening in this situation? If we're curious, we, it, it helps us to resist the impulse to, to make judgments or label, and we can simply be curious about what we're seeing and reflect on it in a way that can, you know, can open up a dialogue and help people to see things. Thank you for that, Jonathan. What you're speaking to, that's as for all of us men on this journey to be healthy masculine allies and leaders it's you know there's this first piece where it requires us to like be interested enough to look at where we're uh coming from unconsciously and how it's impacting other people right however or in addition to where we want to go to and this is a term i didn't know uh six months ago centering others voices and or decentering myself right so therein lies an opportunity for us as, as, as leaders and allies. Can we, will we, shall we center other people's voices by decentering ourselves? Rayona, I'd see you'd like to share something and then I'm gonna to go to you, Sharon, after that. Okay, Rayona, oh yeah. Come off right. me. Yeah, yeah um, I, I wanna give a shout out to Vic about what he was sharing uh, related to his boss and given his boss feedback about how his boss's approach landed for him. And it's one of the more rare things that we see in organizations is people willing enough to be courageous to speak to uh, folks in more senior positions. Um, and there's this thing I've um, kind of learned about organizations called the switch thrower syndrome, which is if you're the person that can throw the switch on someone's paycheck, you're not going to get straight feedback unless you build a culture of that expectation. 
So I think, Vic, you're doing it with courage initially, whether he doesn't sound like he laid out the red carpet, but he took it anyway. And I do think that that's extremely important in these kind of uh, difficult conversations is, especially with more senior male leaders, is to build a cultural environment of feedback as a norm, as opposed to the concern about it having some unintended consequence. Thank you for that, Rayona. Sharona. Uh, sorry, I had to find the mute button. Um, I just wanted, what I got out of my uh, breakout was the power of connection uh, and connection with other people to spread things. Um, so I was actually partnered with someone who I uh, worked with on the Women's Conference at Intel a few years ago. We haven't spoken in many years, but that work led me to the work I do today uh, in inclusion. And the first thing that uh, Yulin shared with me was how her team uses the inclusion conversation cards that mm -hmm. I helped bring into the company. And um, without having any clue that I was the one who had brought them in, and I got those from going to a conference with other DEI uh, practitioners and learning methods from other folks. And so it's just so cool to see the power of all these different connections and the way that um, you can spread the word by like talking about it to people all the time. Thank you for that. Uh, we're going to go into the next breakout. Um, so the let's just build upon what we've been talking about here and, and shift our attention to how will you sustain practices that you put in place or that you might have a new idea of, and based on what you're hearing today and what might that look like? Uh, we're going to put you into breakouts, but we're going to we're going to uh, shorten the time on the breakouts. There's a little timer up top, and then we'll we'll bring you back. Okay. Sorry about that, bit, Ray. I, I didn't mean to bail. I I hit the wrong button on the. And there's well, no. That's kind of what we figured. So <laughs> why don't we start with you, um, just sharing, um, just for everybody, because we know in in the virtual classroom land, oftentimes when we share something about us for ourselves, it it resonates with other people. So kind of what, when you were listening, what came up for you? Uh, well, I, I, I got I to say this is the first time I've, I've been uh, attending one of these. I, I didn't go to the Better Man Conference, although I'm going to try to attend the next one based on this. Uh, yeah. So it, I, I think if the question was, I mean, the first question was, uh, frankly, I, I have to admit, I, I don't recall what the question was in the last session. I love that vulnerability. So you're already a better man. Yeah. So, <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so, what is there anything that you're willing to do, or have you seen to sustain healthy masculinity and inclusion practices in your company? Uh, have I seen? Uh, so I'm, I'm with Intel, and I will say that um, it, it's been uh, it's really been nice to see the change o over the last I'm going to say two years or so with with respect to. Um, somebody had mentioned earlier this this devil's advocate thing, and I don't know that I would have I would have I would have said that it was like that, but I would say that um, um, if you were not the alpha type, you were not going to get your opinion across at Intel historically, right? Yeah. I, and when we were in that last breakout session, one of the things that I thought was interesting what was brought up was um, people talk over each other, and and I think that's something that I'd like to try to figure out how to stop doing is, you know. While one person's still talking, the other one will start their response and they'll talk louder and louder and louder and louder in order to try to um, just, you know, make the other person completely just capitulate to their to their viewpoint. Right. And it's frankly, it's annoying. It's annoying to be on this, you know, the receiving side of it. But, you know, what can you do to I mean, I guess you could call it out, but then you've got to be the one that gets louder and louder and louder to that person that's doing that. Right. Until I did this work, I thought that was an Italian male thing. <laughs> Very <laughs> ineffective for, for me to do. You know, there is one thing you can do, and it's a bit laborious, but it highlights no one speaks until they get the speaking stick or rag or whatever the case may be. And oh my goodness, what an exercise and <laughs> trying okay. to do it. <laughs> so F FYI on that. Who else? I appreciate um, that. Yeah, answering the question, what came up for you? Um, what did you notice in, in this particular session? Uh, 
There he is, Scott. Oh, okay. Yeah. I, I think one of the new ideas that came up when we were, you know, trying to figure out as a staff how we work better together was we set up a virtual face-to-face -face and spent, you know, the whole time kind of talking through, you know, what was going on in our own lives, what, you know, what inspires us. And we just had like a couple, each person got the same set of slides of, you know, pictures, no words, of like things you care about and things you like to do. And then we did, you know, the whole, you know, two, li one, two truths and a lie kind of thing. But it was having that opportunity to connect with everybody them in this strange, you know, all online, you know, um, you know, what work. It was just nice to to, to have that. It's really easy when you're in a staff meeting with them once a week or a couple other meetings and, you know, you're sitting there next to each other, but it was a way to kind of bring some of that back into the environment, you know, while we're all here online. And so I thought I found that really useful. We spent about you know, maybe two hours doing it, but it was incredibly helpful to just, you know, kind of remind each other that we're all people, right? <laughs> Not these little boxes on the screen. <laughs> And what uh, Scott and I were in the same session, and I, I said, I asked him if he'd be willing to share in the main session. I said, when a, a man identifies connection as something that's really important, as far as I'm concerned, that's that's a healthy masculine trait. And it what it reminded me of uh, was in the beginning of Shelter in Place with my own partners, I, I realized that you know, we all needed to tend to the business of being human before we can tend to business. So good on you, Scott, for, you know, coming up with that as a, a practice. We all, we're all business people and the old normal, we all have our heads down and we're not, we weren't connecting with each other. And when we all get hit with this, with these, uh, a variety of tragedies, all we really have is each other. And, and which flies right in the face of one of the outdated masculine norms. I don't need any help. I can do this all by myself, with it, which is a bunch of horse bucky. Who else? <laughs> Jim, I see you smiling there. You want to, you want to, you or Vic, you want to respond to what I just said? Um, well, I, I was going to touch on the alpha and, and within our breakout session, yeah. we got into a, a good conversation around, you know, um, don't confuse competence with confidence. And it goes back to that alpha thing, speaking louder, that, and, and, and really trying to provide that feedback to leaders because it's kind of a bias, right? Yeah. Someone appears confident, they must know what they're talking about, and, and, and vice versa. Um, and, and that's been something that I, I think has been really important, and people kind of take a step back and think, oh, wait a minute, how am I really judging these people? And in fact, in, in inter internally on that, you got to watch out for Dunning Kruger syndrome, which is you're know, thinking you know just because you think it. Oh, right, yeah. I have a bumper sticker that says, don't believe everything you think. <laughs> that statement was coined by Rayona Sharpneck. Oh, really? Years ago. Oh, <laughs> Jim, you were gonna you were gonna say something. I mean, I think one of the uh like one of the truths that go through all of these discussions on this specific specific topic and on related ones is you know, questioning uh, historic definitions of roles and um, equally questioning the behaviors that were associated with those roles and, uh, and deciding, making a conscious decision about what's right and what's, you know, not useful uh, going forward. So. Thank you. Before we go to our, the action steps part of our call, does anybody else have anything they want to add? going once, going I, twice. I would just like to say I have love for all of you and please just keep up the, you know, it's it's really difficult times right now, especially for the next month. So just uh, let's give each other a lot of positive energy and strength. Thanks for that, Matt. And to back up on what Matthew just said, um, that Matt, I want to I want to know and I would love to hear in the last few minutes we have and give everybody a thought um, how do we support men in being as courageous as Vic was with his boss? And, you know, we often talk about, you know, empowering women, empowering, 
you know, from the margins. And that's really, really important. Do not stop that. That is not the prescription I'm offering. Um, I want to know how can we all support each other and how can we support men because it's assumed that's part of toxic masculinity to me is men always being tough enough to go in there. And then that's where the confidence comes. How do we, can we, how do we support the courage that it takes to speak up against that confidence that might not be very competent? Where, how do we support each other with courage? Feel free to answer that in chat. And maybe uh, what we normally do when I'm invite all of us to do right now is after you leave here um, to, to ponder, you know, what new actions will you take? Maybe you can take the cue from, from what Chris just said. How can we support men to be more courageous? Maybe there's an action that you can think of, uh, whether you're a man to other men, whether you're a, a woman to a man, or if you, so yeah, so let's just let's just stick with that. Maybe there's a new action. I want to invite everybody to put that in chat right now. And while you're doing that, um, I'm just going to go over uh, a couple of uh, housekeeping things. Um, so for those of you who have not attended the Better Man Conference and are looking to attend the conference on October 8th, that will be our Eastern Time Conference. We also just got a date certain for our GMT. Uh, for February 22nd. And for those of you, write down that code, uh, GR2020, because it'll give you a 20% discount um, uh, off of the off of the conference. 50%, right? 50. 50, my bad. So let's let's go to the next. So resources. If you want to uh, go to our website, you know, it's you're gonna see anti-rhythm resources there. We have our goal with these calls is to do them every other Friday. We do have the Better Man Conference. So on October 23rd, we are, will be our next uh, community call and we'll have a title and we'll send this out to all of you. Um, I want to take this moment. Excuse, to, excuse me, Ray. What we want is for you to tell us what you want. So we're going to send you a survey. Oh, yeah. And right. you let us know what you want on the October 23rd call, and hopefully we'll get enough responses that we'll have to topics for calls for weeks to come. All right, thanks for that, Ed. So I wanna take this moment to first thank you, Jim and, and Vic, uh, for coming on the call and bringing your contribution, not just today on this call, but what you've been doing behind the scenes. We need more guys like you. So thank you very much. Um, and Intel as our, one of our sponsors and, and partners. Um, I also want to thank everybody who came today and showed up and contributed because that's what makes these calls successful. So on behalf of the Better Man Movement team, uh, which today is Ed and Chris Bell and myself, thank you for coming. Have a safe weekend and hope to see you at the Better Man Conference on October 8th.